Thank you for joining us today for this CAST webinar. I'm Kent Chesky and I serve as the Executive Vice President for the Council for Agriculture Science and Technology, or CAST. We are very pleased to, to share our most recent CAST commentary, the importance of communicating empirically based science for society. Today's webinar is being, re is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the CAST website. As noted on the agenda, we'll have a question and answer session with a panel of authors from this commentary task force after our main presentation. And we'll be opening up the chat box for questions related to this topic in just a few minutes. Next slide, please. CAST was formed in 1972 to provide unbiased, credible science-based information um, about food and agriculture to policymakers, the media, private sector, and the public. CAST is a membership-based organization comprised of scientific and professional societies, nonprofit organizations, universities, companies, and many individuals. It is through our network of members and member organization that we select our topics for CAST papers, as well as access a network of scientists, economists, engineers, and other subject matters specialists who help produce those papers. Next slide, please. CAST has a small staff located in Ames, Iowa. Much of the work that CAST produces is through volunteers who serve on our governing board's task force that compile and write our papers and reviewers who help make sure our papers are unbiased and based upon sound science. Over the past 13 years, we've involved over a thousand subject matter specialists who graciously volunteer their time, energy, and expertise to help us accomplish this work. Next slide. Our publications and information are intended for audiences of policymakers, the media, private sector, the public, and educators. We do this to increase the accessibility, awareness, and understanding of the science, technology, and innovation so critical to food and agriculture. Next slide. If you visit our website, you will see several different publication types of CAST uh, publications. Our most popular are CAST issue papers and commentaries. We also produce an ad quick cast for each of our papers that serves as an easy to access executive summary of key information. We've also recently introduced a student study guide, which we hope will be used by students and teachers to learn more about food, current food and agricultural science issues. Uh, listed on our website are other cast publications that we'll be releasing uh, through the rest of 2020 and over the next several months. Next slide. The use of social media is an important part of our science communication efforts, and I invite you to join us on any of these platforms. Just a reminder that today's web webinar is being recorded. At the end of our main presentation, we'll post a message that the chat box is open for you to submit any questions to our panelists. Like all of our publications, this paper was compiled and written by a task force of volunteer subject matter specialists. The task force chair for this paper was Dr. Stuart Smythe, University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Stuart Smythe is the associate professor in the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics and has been a dedicated research, researcher at the University of Saskatchewan for over a decade. In the fall of 2014, after his, as a result of his research and focus on sustainable agriculture, Dr. Title, Dr. Smythe was granted the title of industry funded where he holds the Agri-Food Innovation Chair and Agri-Food Innovation Sustainability Enhancement Chair in 2019. With his chair and professorship, Dr. Smythe continues to focus on innovations in agriculture. Dr. Smythe, we're very pleased to have you today. I'd like to turn it over for you to lead our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Kent, and, and welcome everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for today's webinar. I'd first like to, to thank my my panelists on this, uh, John Entine, Ruth McDonald, Cami Ryan, and, and Megan Wolster Radcliffe, thank you so much for the, the time and effort you've put into drafting and revising and, and, and everything to reach today. And an extended a thanks as well to the reviewers, to Alexander Gregorowitz uh, and Sarah Lukey and Caroline Rhodes, and also to, to Gabe Middleton for, for coordinating the, the activities that, that have allowed us to, to reach today. So, so thank you to everybody. So the main question that we decided we wanted to try and address through this report is why does misinformation matter? We all see it on a daily basis, but, but does it really have an impact on our lives or on the policies that are affect our lives? And, 
And ultimately, we agreed that it does have an impact. And so we wanted to delve in and, and try to better understand it a little bit more. So what we wanted to do was, was look at the impact that innovations have on our lives on a daily basis. So the fact that that we have access to safe food, to healthy medicines, to vaccines that prevent us from future diseases. All of these are, are beneficial innovations to our society. Yet, so many organizations and activists take the, the benefits of these innovations and turn them around and say, but there's a fraction of the population that are being left behind or that could be impacted. And so what this is resulting in is that there's safe and beneficial technologies, especially agriculture biotechnology that, that's proven to increase yields and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So the result is that these technologies are not reaching some of the, the most dire need in societies and, and regions around the world. And as the FAO has identified, the, the number of people that are food insecure presently is about 680 million people. This had come down over the, the first 10 to 15 years of this millennium, but unfortunately it's been increasing over the last five to seven years. And the FAO is predicting this number to, to increase over the, the coming 20 to 30 years. So the fact that misinformation is having a significant cost on the adoption of technologies that improve food security it is having a, a direct impact on our lives, not only in terms of, of the supply of food, but also in our health in terms of access to, to safe drugs and, and vaccines. Next slide, please. We've seen a, a global access to beneficial technologies. As you can see here, these are stats that come from the World Health Organization. Virtually every country in the world has adopted vaccination programs for infants against hepatitis B. And, and it was just last month that the WHO announced that wild type polio had been globally eradicated. So there's incredible evidence that quantifies just how safe vaccines and, and programs are, yet the anti-vax movement is still continually advocating that, that drugs and vaccines are not safe for society. Similarly, the, the same message comes from genetically modified crops. Globally, about one third of the countries on the planet have, have either adopted the production of GM crops or they import them for food or, or livestock feed purposes, yet activist organizations are, are daily disseminating information that, that, that contradicts the safety of, of these technologies. Next slide, please. So the basis for sound science goes back centuries. And, and in fact, it wasn't until about the middle part of the 1600s that science, what we know is, as the, the basis for sound scientific experiments began to evolve out of what had existed through the Middle Ages and, and for decades or centuries prior to that as, as alchemy, where someone posing as a, as a knowledgeable person would, would contact a, a, a leader of influence, a king or a, a monarch, and convince them that they were able to, to do something, turn lead into gold, for example. And the ruler would award funding to allow them to try to do this, which as we we can draw on, on hindsight now, we, we know that this ended in abject failure time after time. It wasn't until Robert Boyle came along in, in the 1660s and started to put together the, the basis for the, the points that are illustrated there around what sound science looks like. So he was the first to really articulate these components that you had to have a clear and testable question, that you had to have a an experiment that was based on principles that could be repeated by other scientists, that you had to have a, a control group so that you could test for a true effect, that your results su were supported by the data you had gathered, and that once you were done the experiment, you would write it up into a, into a research paper and it would be submitted to, to journals 
and and this would create a venue for discussion. And, and Boyle was really the first to articulate that discussions or disagreements about methodologies or experiment results should be based on the, the science and the data rather than personal attacks against one researcher against another or about the use of a methodology, but it should be based on the, the research that was undertaken. And so over the last 370 odd years, of course, this has become refined, more knowledge has been generated. Next slide, please. So we're at the point now that it's estimated that there's a capital stock of, of knowledge that, that's somewhere in the range of 50 million articles. And you can see that this is growing at a rate of about a, a million and a half, 1.6 million articles annually. So, so to try and keep track of this knowledge is, is beyond the comprehension or the, the ability of, of any one of us as individuals. And what has really changed is, is the transition over the last 20, 25 years of moving from journals that were manually printed and mailed on a, on a monthly or quarterly basis to subscribers to moving to online platforms where journal articles are available to everybody that has an internet connection. So this could be um, an individual sitting at home, someone working as a, a reporter for a newspaper or TV, or someone that's involved in social media communications as well. So, so everybody can have access to journal articles that are listed as open access. And you can see that the significant increase in the number of journals that, that are open access, up to you know, 12,000 journals or more two years ago were listed as open access. So open access is when as, as a researcher, you have the option of publishing and, and not paying a fee, which would be very similar to publishing a, a, a printed article 25 years ago in, a, in, a, in an issue bound journal. Only the people that had the subscription to the journal would be able to read the article. But for a fee of as much as a, a, a thousand to several thousand dollars, researchers can pay to remove that public restriction to the, the article. And so, if that fee is paid when it's published by any journal, that means that anybody with the internet connection can go and click on the, the link to the journal, download the PDF of the article, and have it available on their own computer for, for their own viewing and, and information purposes. Next slide, please. What has paralleled this is a rise in, in predatory journals that are not based on science. Virtually the first thing I do six days a week when I open my email is go through and delete as much as half a dozen or 10 invitations from predatory journals every day asking me to submit a journal article of, of two to four pages and they guarantee it'll be published within two weeks. The reality of this is there's no peer review, there's no formatting, there's no editing that goes on and I would have to pay a fee of several thousand dollars to, to have my article or my submission published in a predatory journal. And really all this is a business opportunity to, to publish poor and, and junk science that's been rejected by journals that have a rigorous peer review process where experts in the discipline review the, the hypothesis, the research methodologies, the data, they confirm that the, the results match the, the data that was generated and that the, the discussion and the takeaway observations are, are realistic based on the data that was generated. So none of that exists in the predatory journals. And as you can see over the last nearly 20 years, the number of predatory journals has quadrupled, which creates a significant amount of, of information that, that masquerades as rigorous science, but is, has no merit in, in any of the fundamentals required of what is good scientific research. Next slide, please. So what has become some of the result of this? Well, we know 
from our own observations that, that innovations are disruptive. They have all kinds of impacts on our lives. And a good way of framing this is with new drugs, when they're, they're tested through clinical research trials, they come back and, and they know that these drugs will have an impact on, on maybe one in a million people. So that would mean if we took the population of Canada and the United States with 370 odd million people, that if a new drug or vaccine was commercialized this week, that possibly 370 people might have an adverse reaction to taking this drug. And what these activist groups are trying to do is to frame that the, the potential harm that might come to 370 people outweighs the benefits to the 370 million people that, that will be have better lives or better health as a result of, of having access to this, this drug or vaccine. So they've really turned the table around on focusing on a, on a tiny percentage of the population that, that may be harmed compared to, to rejecting the benefits for virtually everybody else in society. And, and that's what's come out of a lot of the the disruption that recent innovations have, have created is that these activist organizations are allowed to prey on the lack of knowledge that society in general has about plant breeding, food production, or vaccine development. And so they're able to, to create campaigns of, of misinformation that try to generate fear and uncertainty in the population about new innovations. And in fact, it's gone so far that when reports or articles in the, in the news that quote scientists are published, these scientists are attacked online. Two years ago, I had an opportunity to give a presentation to the editorial board of a farm newspaper based in Saskatoon, the Western producer. And, and in talking to the editorial board after the presentation, they said the biggest challenge they have right now is to get scientists, whether they're university scientists or scientists at government institutions to go on the record and be quoted for articles in their paper because so many activists are targeting these online uh, venues and attacking the scientists that make any comment. And so as a result of this, it's intimidated academics and scientists to to be quoted for journal articles because they simply don't want to deal with the, the hate emails that they get or the online attacks that are uh, trying to, to ruin their reputations just simply for reporting the results of, of a scientific experiment and, and the knowledge that has been generated. So the, the pessimism around the, the technologies has created um, a, a very negative environment for academics to, to be engaged in science communication. Next slide, please. So we know that, that innovations are going to be fundamental for, for the remainder of, of this century and, and the centuries that are going to follow. It was reported in The Economist in April that of the 86 drugs and vaccines that were based in Europe that were being developed for coronavirus testing and, and COVID vaccines, the vast majority of them were based on, on biotechnology and which would require all of these drugs to be regulated as equivalent to GMOs. And in July, the European Commission actually had to lift some of the, the regulations even to allow for the, the beginning of, of clinical trials. So the European Union is going to face a significant quandary in either later this year or early in 21, when the first of these vaccines become potentially available for commercialization is, is how is the European Union going to deal with that, that, that all of these drugs and vaccines will have been developed equivalent to GMOs, which within the European framework now takes four to six years to work its way through their regulatory system. Are, is the European regulatory system for COVID drugs and vaccines going to, to comply with environmental activists based regulations that will take four to six years? I highly doubt any population anywhere on the planet would, would find that as an acceptable 
solution to, to dealing with the pandemic. And, and so Europe is going to have to, to look at ways to remove politics from, from their regulations and move them back to, to more of a science-based framework, which is what we have in Canada and the United States. And it, it's, it's particularly unique now that there's been hundreds of, of journal articles that have been published over the last 20 years by academics and scientists that, that quantify the, the benefits from genetically modified crops resulting from ag biotech with less tillage, reduced soil erosion, and you can see the list of benefits there. And what it's, it's doing is it's really confirming that these environmental activist organizations that are, are maintaining opposition to GM crops are fundamentally confirming that their opposition to these technologies, which are helping to reduce and mitigate climate change, their opposition is no longer grounded in science the way it was 20 and 25 years ago. And, and that they're rejecting the science-based rationale and, and the evidence that confirms this. And really what, what they're about is uh, they're based on deliberate campaigns of misinformation and disinformation that, that generates a lot of money through fundraising activities based on, on these incorrect campaigns of, of misinformation. Next slide, please. So we know that that these regulations are, are having an impact and, and that the EU is, is going to be in a, a difficult situation. The EU has put out a, a farm or a, a field to fork policy that encourages a move to organic and, and agroecology over the next 10 to 20 years. And, and this has brought strong response from, from farm organizations saying that it's going to remove access to technologies that allow them to be profitable. So There's been ample evidence over the last 20 years as well that the regulatory framework within the European Union puts pressure on technology adoption in African Asian countries and that this is one of the principal reasons that researchers and, and institutes that, that have had the ability to develop genetically modified crops in, in both of those continents have had reservations about commercializing these technologies. And now as, as research moves from inserting foreign genes, which is what genetic modification has been to, to this precise and targeted control muted genetic technologies within gene engineering, or pardon me, gene editing, researchers in, in developing countries have a tremendous ability to adopt these technologies and use lo local crop varieties to better to provide more nutritious varieties or varieties that can, can maintain higher yield through um, changing climactic conditions. So these technologies are providing a lot of opportunity, yet the EU is still trying to, to regulate gene editing based on regulations that were developed 20 years ago before any of these technologies were, were even developed. So it, it's, it's going to create significant challenges and and it'll be important to, to see where particularly regulatory agencies in Africa decide to follow. Are they gonna continue to follow the, the EU path that rejects safe technologies and, and, and products, or are they gonna follow many of the other industrial countries in, in North and South America, uh, India and, and Australia in adopting these technologies? Next slide, please. So what's resulted from this is that misinformation has created an economic value. And this is certainly identified by, by groups there like uh, the World Economic Forum saying this is one of the, the most significant threats to the current economy is this whole aspect of digital misinformation where it's, it's spread on, on all of our social media platforms. We see this on a daily basis and, and to some extent, um, it was uh, <clears throat> mentioned in a, in a good article by Tim Caulfield at the University of Alberta a little bit earlier saying that, you know, as scientists, we have a responsibility to, to reach out and correct this misinformation when we see it. But when, when we see it, but I think a lot of us feel that by doing that, we're, 
it feels a little bit like we're, we're trapped in a quicksand pit and every time we reach out to correct a piece of misinformation, we sink a little bit lower in the quicksand. So it, it, it's a frustration that, that's a daily occurrence for most of us in, in research and science communication that, that we see so much of this in and we never know when we have a, a positive effect because all we continue to see are the, the activist responses that, that continue to perpetuate myths and fears that, that have been around for, for over 20 years and you see them constantly recycled for, for every new technology that comes along. And, and so we're seeing the, the same myths and fears about gene editing as there was about genetic modification at, that first arose in the late 1990s. So it is evident that misinformation is, is very profitable and, and that these fears and, and myths are simply not going to go away. And so as science communicators and researchers, we need to think about how can we move forward and, into an environment or a future that that tries to, to reduce these. Next slide, please. So as I've mentioned, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of confirmation that shows just how safe modern technologies are. There's, you know, excess of 3,000 studies that have, have examined GM crops around the world to confirm um, and, and quantify just how, how beneficial they are. Cammy Ryan on the panel has, has put out a study earlier this year that, that looks at the impact that alternative health blogs and websites are having to, to pre present accurate information about uh, new food products and crops and vaccines because th there's money to, to, be pres to be raised. In one of the classes I teach on innovation, I, I, I take a bit of time and, and talk about some of the, the, the responses from the medical community to innovation. So when vaccines were first commercialized nearly 200 years ago, medical doctors of the day were making a lot of money by selling sugar pills. And so they, because the first vaccines against um, chicken, chicken pox came from, from the, the cowpox vaccine, they, they said that if you had your ch child vaccinated, it, it would start to develop bovine features there was a great likelihood that your child would begin to run around on all fours and, and holler like, like cattle do. So these were what, you know, medical doctors of the day, which people still, which people trusted then and today are the experts, were, were, were saying the features from, from vaccines could be. And we still see that today, that, that experts have alternative health blogs and websites to, to promote products that simply have absolutely no benefit to, to individuals in any way, shape, or form. Next slide, please. So how do we move forward in this environment of, of what the WHO has, has coined an infodemic? Ultimately, it's going to come down to, to how trust is built between those with knowledge and those seeking knowledge. We need to, to see more money invested in, in to to help scientists and, and academics become communicators. It's not just about dumping probabilities and statistics onto people looking for information because you can provide a tsunami of data, but if the person seeking information simply doesn't value statistical information, but relies more on a scientist talking about why they, use a product or a, a new GM food or a vaccine and how that integrates into their family, how they use to, to feed or, or vaccinate their own children and family members. It's those type of stories that communicate trust to individuals looking for information that, that helps to reassure them that these new and innovative products and technologies are safe and, and they, their uncertainties are eased a little bit when experts talk about how they integrate these products and technologies into their own lives on a, on a daily, weekly, or monthly, or yearly basis. So it's important that large-scale science projects better integrate the social science components into their science. It's, it's not just about the, the patents and publications that come out at the end of a large-scale research product 
project, but it's about integrating the, the social science challenges and, and issues and, and helping to build those trust relationships between the experts doing the research and, and the, the people in society that are seeking information. So that concludes the, the presentation of the report and I now turn it over to the panelists that have been watching the questions come in and I will turn it to John first. John, I'll give you a few minutes to sort of pose a couple of questions and, and then some of your responses to them. John, could I just interrupt before we get into the Q&A, I just wanted to, to make a couple announcements and we'll get all those questions uh, pulled over. Uh, I did want to share with our panelists while we're getting ready for that Q&A that we've got some other webinars coming up that I want to make sure you're aware of. On October 13th, we're going to be having a presentation for our CAST, Borlaug CAST Communication Award uh, uh, featuring this year's winner, Dr. Alexa Lamb, who's going to speak on this topic of effectively communicating science in time of crisis, kind of building on this presentation. Um, and also then a couple of days following that, all of this during the World Food Prize, we're going to be offering another uh, webinar on food biofortification, reaping the benefits of science to overcome a hidden hunger. Um, and Dr. Harth Boyce with CG AIR will be leading that. Uh, and in mid-November, we're going to have our final issue paper of 2020. It's on gr uh, uh, ground and air robots for production agriculture opportunities and challenges. Uh, led by Dr. Santos Pila with the University of Nebraska Lincoln. So, um, next slide, please. And as as Stuart's leading, we'll now kind of turn it over to our panelists. And let me just introduce them real briefly: Stuart Smythe, uh, Dr. Ruth McDonald, Professor and Chair of Food Science and Human Nutrition at Iowa State University; Dr. Cami Ryan, uh, Social and Behavioral Science Lead at Bear Crop Sciences. Mr. John Entine, Executive Director of the Genetic Literacy Project, and Dr. Megan Wolster Ratcliffe, CEO of the American Society of Animal Science. So I'll turn it back over to the panel and we look forward to some discussion and response to the many questions that we're getting in the chat box so far. Thank you. Stuart? Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, it's Cami Ryan here. I, I might as well jump in. No one else is saying anything. Thanks for having us and Stuart, thanks for leading things off. I think an important distinction here to make is what's the difference between misinformation and disinformation and why is it important to make that, uh, that why is it important to distinguish the two? Um, Misinformation uh, is, re is reported in the, in the literature as inaccurate or incomplete, as uh, Stuart had referred to, but it, it, it misleads most often through mistake, like an honest mistake, through negligence, and through bias. And we see this running through our Facebook feeds all the time. Disinformation is qualitatively different though. Um, it is defined in the literature as a product of a carefully planned and technically sophisticated deceit process. And it comes with intended or expected outcomes. And the reason why we really need to understand the difference between the two is because if we have to manage or mitigate mis or disinformation, we need to understand that this is not homogeneous, that there's context always behind things, and there's no really great cookie cutter approach to address any of these things. So I don't know, that, uh, this is a piece of, of the uh, literature puzzle that I'm really fascinated with um, and, and in my own work, my own research. And I think it's important to make that distinction, especially when we're looking at problem solving around these things. So thank you. Tammy, uh, this is John Entine. I, I'd like to jump in here because I think you've raised a great point, um, <clears throat> but I'd like to add an, another dimension to the issue, which is, and it reflects actually on one of the questions, which is um, what are the motivation or incentives to groups to spread misinformation about vaccines or GMOs? And I think there's really um, three incentives and it shows that this issue of misinformation and disinformation is actually interwoven. Rarely can you separate the two and rarely are the groups or individuals that are either subject to or um, disseminating this information 
Um, I mean, they're not uh, focused on which category it falls in. They usually draw a little bit from category A and category B. I would say the three um, things that we need to think about uh, when we're, um, especially when we're responding or trying to understand um, advocacy group uh, involvement in these debates is one, that there is a genuine belief by advocacy groups that they are on the side of right. They are not uh, in their minds, engaging in disinformation sometimes. Sometimes they believe that they, um, the means justify the ends and they do put out, consciously put out misinformation. But I think there's a, um, uh, we have to be careful not to um, overly demonize them as, as, as somehow having even a financial incentive. The financial incentives usually for advocacy groups are really the perpetuation of the advocacy group itself rather than some personal um, financial incentive, which doesn't make it um, less real, but it makes it, um, in, in, in their minds, they justify the means on the means ends issue. Um, but I think what underlies most of the uh, so-called disinformation and misinformation from advocacy groups comes down to uh, a genuine kind of leftist belief, and I say this as someone who is politically left, uh, that there is some kind of corporate control that is infused through um, uh, the agricultural biotechnology uh, business uh, world. And I think that there, that has been historically true because of GMOs, though to some degree that was forced upon um, uh, the biotech industry by the regulatory hurdles um, encouraged by advocacy groups. Um, but that is something that won't go away very easily. So I'll, I'll end with one suggestion, which is that a lot of our um, messaging on these issues should um, come down to the issues of sustainability. Uh, which is, again, one of those words that's meaningless to everybody, but has some meaning at the very same time. Uh, but it is one issue that will appeal to people who are being hit by misinformation. And I think it forces those who are presenting disinformation to actually back up their allegations. Because um, I think when you do sustainability um, analysis, you find out that no one agricultural system delivers the goods. You really need to pick from a potpourri of um, uh, farming techniques, and I think that changes the nature of the debate to deliverables rather than to issues that are ephemeral, like corporate control. Thank you, John. Hi, this is Megan. If it's okay, I want to jump in with a couple of things. Um, when we first started working on this, um, I did a bunch of the publications methods that are written in it, and we kept getting comments back that didn't really fit the paper, and I think that that's very true, right? Because scientific publications as a piece of it is supposed to counter misinformation. But as I'm watching the comments come across, I think there's lots of things that we don't understand in that process already. When we look at science information being put out there, I think I saw a comment come across about kind of the value of impact factor and the value of altmetrics. And I think we have to look at the impact factor is more about what scientists are thinking about our publications. The altmetrics are more an idea of how good of a job are we taking that information, reducing it down to um, an easy, understandable, digestible way for the public to see, and then pushing it out there. Um, and so a lot of times you see high altmetric scores if a piece of information has been mishandled and put out by misinformation, or high altmetric scores if um, a society has taken their journal pieces and is starting to push that information out as quote unquote good information. Uh, this is Ruth McDonald. I'll jump in here on a question about education. How do you sort through scientific information and how do you know good science from predatory science? Um, and, and this is extremely challenging. Uh, I think we in the academic world are well aware of the fact that scientists have sort of lived in a bubble and tried to uh, you know, talk to ourselves and, and that has to change. Uh, there has to be a, a much clearer expectation that scientists communicate their work to the public and do it in a way that they understand. Uh, and, and so this is something that I think all academics need to be uh, doing more of and training our up and coming scientists to expect that they have to uh, talk to the lay public in a, in a much broader way than we have before. It is difficult for even scientists to sort through what is a predatory journal and what is a peer reviewed journal. And there isn't a simple button you can click to figure that out. 
I put in the chat box uh, two databases that are open to the public for anyone to use, PubMed and Agricola, which are a good way to start if you're trying to really sort through science literature and understand what is a good publication. They only will uh, include publications that are peer reviewed in those databases. So it's a good way to start to, start to understand that. Um, but and we really do have to start with science education in elementary school and to teach children what is science and why do we do science and how do we do science so that when they grow up and make decisions that they understand uh, the scientific uh, uh, method and are better uh, able to sort through the misinformation. I'm gonna tack onto what Ruth said. Um, most of, a lot of our journals that aren't predatory come up through um, our professional organizations and our professional organizations were formed kind of in the last 50 to 150 years with the specific goal of being internal and providing good services to our members. And that has shifted in the last 25 years. And now all of a sudden to provide good services to our members, we have to externalize. And that's a really, that's a huge shift organizationally for any of us to meet. And it's a shift on the individual level. We started in ASAS a few, uh, 10 years ago now, with taking parts of our journals and then putting out a junior animal scientist and a website that's associated that's more towards elementary education. And I have to say it was one of our hardest products to launch and hardest programs to launch because for us, it was going against everything that we've learned about internally controlling the quality of our peer review and now externalizing it. And it's a huge shift. Thank you, Megan. I'm just going to jump in. There was a there was a question about the how the EU is going to regulate some of these new gene editing editing technologies, and and that's going to be a huge challenge for them because plants naturally, you know, not just plants, but everything mutates from one generation to the next. So, depending on the plant species, it could be up to 20 different genes in a plant are different from they were in in the parent variety. So the natural rate of mutation is, is in some cases going to be higher than what the gene edited rate of mutation is. And when there's no ability to detect, Europe has put it itself into a box or put itself into a, a really impossible situation to, to move from. And in fact, the, the European Commission has called for a report to be published or put together and, and submitted to the Parliament by next spring, and there's a, a, a webinar of policymakers and regulators being held next week in Brussels to, to deal with this. And so I'm speaking at, at, on how Canada's regulating gene editing at that, but clearly the, the scientific community is pushing back against the, the sort of politics or, or hazard-based, pardon me, um, fear-based precautionary method that the EU regulations are based on and trying to encourage more of a, a science-based rationale. So uh, we're, you know, I'm hopeful that the policymakers will listen to, to the outcome of this event. And, and I think a lot of it can be framed up the way Mark Linus has, has explained his transition when he was a, a Greenpeace protester in the, the early part of the 20s or uh, of the 2000s and and was a supporter of action on climate change and, and started to ask the question that if the, the same science that, that's being used to quantify changing climactic conditions is the same science that develops vaccines, is the same science that develops new crop technologies, then, then why would he support one aspect of science and, and reject another aspect? And so he's one of the, the certainly the, the highlights that's come out of the environmental movement to say that, look, science is science. And, and whether it's dealing with climate change, vaccines, or genetically modified crops, it's, it's the same science across the board. There was a question, um, why is science a good thing for climate change, but not to be trusted for modern agricultural biotech? Um, just briefly, I, I think this goes back to a, a point that I made earlier, which is 
uh, it's, it's really a tribal thing to a large degree, uh, which is that climate change is uh, viewed, uh, climate change science is viewed as coming from the academic community or the government independent, independent government community. So therefore it's automatically endowed with a, with a credibility that um, biotech related science is not because for better or for worse, biotechnology innovation has rested with industry and corporations. So um, it's odd because if, if it was, if we were uh, clearly just uh, supposing that people would make science-based choices, um, they would, it would be about the same. We can all recall the AAS Pew study from 2015, which said that uh, the percentage of scientists that em embraced the reality of human-induced climate change was 88%, 87%, while the percentage of scientists with AAS who embraced the safety of um, uh, agricultural biotechnology, GMOs at that point, was 87%. Um, so really the gap is based, I think, on the uh, tribal corp perception that uh, agribusinesses are so-called controlling or generating the science. And one other point is Rob, Rob Walbridge, I think, made a very good point that there is a um, perception that a lot of supporters of, of biotechnology engage in some of the same kind of um, whitewashing of their position kind of um, washing out the nuances uh, that is clearly coming from the um, anti-biotech, uh, hardened anti-biotech community. And that's a, that's a fair warning. Everyone should be careful that the issue should be as much as possible based in evidence and just e invoking, oh, we're science-based um, is, is not a convincing argument and actually backfires. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the other thing you can even see that in the comments that are coming through on any of these topics, whether it's sustainability, whether it's climate change, whether um, just whether it's GMOs, I think the other thing is we have to be very careful in how we speak and that we're very positive. Um, saying that we're science based and that others aren't tends to be perceived as being derogatory to the audiences that are not science based. Mm. And so I think we have to be really positive in our messaging. And also really understanding that you're talking to people who are experts in other things and we don't want to be spoken down to either. I think an awareness of bias is really important. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes uh, in our communication efforts or our impassioned efforts to try to share uh, evidence or even our opinion on things is that we get we trip over our own biases without even clearly understanding that we have them and everybody has biases so communication is a lot different now the landscape is different i think this is uh, just an extension upon what ruth had said earlier we have to you know science literacy matters of course it matters but I think we're living in a whole different world now where we as human beings connect completely differently than we did 10, 20 years ago, which means that we've got to understand this landscape of how information is shared in order to really mitigate or understand it. But we also have to understand that all of this, uh, the underlying biases that drive all of our behaviors, because we all have them. And I think sometimes that gets us into these communication pickles where we can, uh, whether you know we're good intentioned about it or not that we can put people off and i think communication has become both art and science now and it's important to understand uh just as megan outlined that that we have to kind of find that middle ground of of being able to communicate and translating our knowledge in an effective way that's relatable to multiple audiences oh i totally agree with that and i also wanted to um address a question about what do we want or what, do, what would we like to see from uh, professional uh, science communicators and agricultural organizations? And I, my answer would be more, more, more. Um, I get questions all the time, where's a good place to go for reliable information on GMOs? And if you look at the amount of misinformation that's on the internet, uh, it way outstrips anything that is um, more science-based. So we just need to be providing more helpful information uh, in, a, in a space where people can access, access it easily, and that is the internet and through social media. So 
and this is a little bit off subject too, I'm seeing a bunch come across on the comments about kind of quality of peer review and that there are journals, there are articles that come through that were poorly re peer reviewed that end up becoming information. And I think where this has really changed in the last 20 years is if you go back in time to the Socratic method overall, the theory was that good science was reviewed by scientists, it moved forward, it was elevated, and it would, what would, it's what would be cited later on, and bad science fell away. As we've moved towards open access and kind of this perpetual amount, huge amount of information that's open to everybody, that has given way to bad science never really seems to go away. So we are going to either have to really kind of hone in on quality of peer review, or we're going to have to start to educate the public more on how to review the information they're getting out of an article. Well, and you know, in extent on that, Megan, too, the other piece of this is that uh, we can't draw a really hard line between predatory publications and regular scientific journals, because I've also read very good <laughs> articles in predatory journals, and I've read some poorly peer-reviewed ones in good publications. So, Absolutely. It's hard, yeah, it's hard to draw those lines. Um, but I just want to address a point here made by Dr. Alison Van Eenenem. She She mentioned that there's not a whole lot of support mechanisms in the institutions for those with the expertise to kind of move forward and communicate. And I think that's another thing that we talked to or talked about earlier is that um, we, we need to kind of support the experts in their efforts to do knowledge translation and to do outreach in, in new and interesting ways because people are clearly hungry for information and they want it and we have to find ways to do it in, 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 in really provocative and interesting ways. I think that's important and I, I know that if I were still at the university still working as an academic probably like most academics, you're really on your own. You're, if you are a, out there and actively a science communicator in mainstream spaces, it's because it's on your own volition. And while that's an important piece of this, because communicators, they, want, they have to want to do it. They have to want to engage in that kind of activity. But it also helps if the institution you're working with is supportive of such endeavors. But I think that we're getting there. I like to think optimistically around these things. Resources are constantly expanding. Um, but again, yes, there, there are some deficits there. And I think that that's things that need to be addressed as well. So I also see one of my favorite comments about the kind of, it depends when we as scientists go out and speak, we're much easier for the, you know, quote unquote, the other side to argue with because we're much more going to come back to, well, it depends on this or it depends on this situation. Um, and how do we get away from that mentality? And what I tell people all the time is that if we kind of put caveats around all of our scientific information, what leaves in a talk to us is, well, they sort of believe this, but not really, whereas the other side is much more adamant. So I tell people when you go out and you give a scientific-based talk that you're trying to bring to the general public, pick three facts in your science-based talk that are that support what you're talking about, that can be really easy taglines, and so that even if you put a bunch of caveats around it, your audience leaves with those three points as non-debatable. Because um, I think that goes to, as scientists, we're really about, you know, kind of a full level of understanding. So we can very easily go from point to point and move around and have evidence shift our opinions. But when we're speaking to the public, we have to be stronger in this is the point we're making and move forward because that's the other, what the other side is doing. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to follow up on, on Cammie's response to, to Allison's question and her comment. And, and I agree that one of the things that needs to change is to, to better incentivize public scientists to engage because right now there's nothing that would, would benefit them in any way to engage in, in science communication or, or any of these types of activities. So the, the reward mechanism has to change within the, the academic institutions to, to incentivize academics to, to become involved in writing op-eds or blogs or whatever the mechanism is going to be, but it, it nudges them in that direction. And I mean, it's not a, a quick turnaround, but, but hopefully within a few years, if with a program in, like that in place, it, it would be possible to have more academics engaging in, in these trust building exercises.
Um, also looking at the comments, one of the other interesting things is talking about visual fields. And there's great studies on how much faster we process a picture than how we process words. Mm -hmm. And that in today's day and age, and this is one of my favorite things to talk about, um, on any given day, we read probably as much as the first Harry Potter book. And that's different than 30 years ago. So we have started at ASAS simplifying as much as possible down to infographics. And I have been amazed at when we put the infographics, which is a nice little pictorial picture of a science point, out on social media, how much more general pickup we get for our science articles. And then where we see small snippets of those infographics showing up in totally random places. So I would encourage the scientists to really start to think about where you put things graphically and using those as a main point of communication on social media. I, I agree, Megan. And that's the other thing, like we have, uh, there's, there is virtual uh, abstracts now, they're doing video abstracts. There's a whole range of things that we have to do what we have is we're living, we've always lived in a world of short attention spans, but now with social media and all of that, that, that virtual space that's inundating us every day, all of a sudden we're competing for pe people's attention in different ways. So the visual aspects are so important right now. So any way that we can communicate in a way that's simple to the point, uh, it's as simple as even simplifying our, our, our PowerPoint presentations and putting more images in, those are ways that we can um, engage with audiences and that they can have a takeaway from what, we, what we're trying to present. So again, back to the point, it is an art and a science. Um, we of course want to be science-based, we want to have the evidence in place, but we want to be artful in how we're presenting it because we are trying to weed through all of that information, those data bites out there, and come up with something that people really want to listen to. And how are we doing for time? Do we have an opportunity for the panelists to provide sort of a, a last insight or comment? Yeah, we have probably time for a really quick closing comment from each of the panelists and then we'll kind of, we'll wrap it up. Thank okay. You. Ruth, would you like to go first? Yeah, sorry, I wasn't unmuted. Um, I'm just going to say that all this talk about scientists communicating is really important. Scientists are not trained to tell stories. We're, taught, we're trained to stick to the facts. And so we have to have a mind shift in how we train scientists to be able to communicate to the public. And it's, it's really critical. Um, I think our, our futures depend on it. Megan. So I'm going to disagree. I think we are trained to tell stories. I think it's just really different. Um, when we write a grant proposal or when we write a review article, we're telling the story of our research. I think we just need to take those skills and make them more relatable. Great. John. Okay. Maybe, maybe. Uh, okay, yeah, I was there. I was just on mute. Um, but thank you. Um, it, I'm, I'm struck that this, you can almost transport many of the elements of this discussion back 20 years. Um, and I'm not sure we've made, I uh, really question how much progress because all these um, suggestions about how to modify our communication strategy really became apparent after the failures of the late 1990s. Um, so I, I, I really do think we, got, we have to think a, a, out of the box and try to find new alliances. It's, we can't just communicate our way out of these issues. And there are plenty, of, the, the world is changing. Um, I mean, I have a 22 year old daughter um, who's very agnostic about what technologies can, can bring the kind of solutions that we need. And I think we have to refocus our debate uh, in, in tune with the concerns about climate change in tune with concerns that COVID has, um, has brought to the surface and uh, not argue the technology itself but argue what it can do. And gene editing opens up a new window for that discussion. And it also puts uh, precautionary Europe back on its heels. Um, I, in, a, in a recent article, I, I was absolutely shocked to find out that uh, if, if you look at the, the top countries in terms of use of um, uh, high, high toxic pesticides per acre, per hectare, 
the United States ranked well below uh, 80% of the European in a per hectare use of, of chemicals. Th those are shocking statistics only in the sense, because I think most crop protection chemicals are safe, but shocking only in the sense that it, it plays into the sustainability um, uh, discussion, which I think has to underpin a, a communication shift um, if we're, if we're going to make any progress in these areas. Thanks, John. Cammy. Uh, just uh, a quick final thing. You know, misinformation and disinformation on anything uh, related to agriculture, whether we're talking uh, GMOs, gene editing, or chemistries, this is nothing new in agriculture. But I think what we found with COVID of late is that the, the uh, dare I say, the boats have been raised around misinformation. I, pe I think people largely are more aware of the impacts of misinformation. This to me is an opportunity for us in agriculture, because I think that while they're attending to this whole issue of the pandemic, we're still dealing with these under, this underlying landscape of how mis and disinformation works. And we have an opportunity here to understand, of course, how mis and disinformation uh, works around the pandemic. And we're seeing a lot of resources being put towards understanding that. But it means that this is an opportunity for us to learn as an industry for agriculture. So I think we should keep our, our minds open to those opportunities and try to encourage uh, encourage some um, some research and work around understanding that landscape of mis and disinformation so that we can somehow manage that whole space a lot better moving forward so that we can be proactive. Thank you, Cammy. And I think we're going to have to wrap up there. Um, okay. Over to you, Kent. Okay. Well, thank you, Stuart. Thank you to the panel. It's been a great uh, presentation, great discussion, comment. Can we capture the, the chat discussion. We'll try to capture as much of that as we can. Any of the questions we didn't get to, we'll try to answer offline with our, uh, with our panelists and, and we'll be posting that document as soon as it's available. Uh, but here's the, the uh, where the, if you haven't seen the paper, this is how you access it. Also here's emails for our panelists. Again, thank you for uh, your work on this. And, and I think they're uh, available to answer any questions you may have. Thanks for joining our webinar. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Please come back to future ones. Uh, specifically, I'd like to thank and acknowledge our friends at Dairy Management Inc. for their assistance in, in helping us put on this webinar. Thank you and have a good day.